Good morning. This is Jim the Keys bartender coming to you from Key Largo. I hope I turned down that music. Yep, I did. It is a beautiful day. It's a little cloudy. I just had a mishap of trying to do a live show and it in being a two part live show. I'm watching on HBO. There there is a segue. I'm watching this show called The Nevers, along with Mayor of East Town. And let me say once again, they revel in the exactness of their Philadelphia accent. I mean, I don't know who the fuck they got to do it, but they are dead on with their long O's and all that stuff. It's like people are finally getting the, the accents, just like Fargo. What Fargo did for the Minnesota accent, Mayor East... East Town is, I was ready to say Eastwick because I just saw the witches of Eastwick too. But the accent, it's amazing how sometimes they ignore regional accents. But regional accents are not, uh, what I know the point I was going to start off with was, was, it was going to be new cell phone, new wife, you know, like that. But uh, I'll explain why. Uh, the the accent thing is just like a new fad. Now, for years, Americans weren't that mobile. So anybody that grew up, chances are when you grew up, uh, were born someplace, you were going to die in that place. And it was a rarity that people would move. It was unusual. Meaning, if you were born in the Philadelphia area, chances are you're going to die within 30 miles of the Philadelphia area. Nowadays, with the mobile society we have, there's a really good chance that you don't. I I was in a military family, so we were probably one of the first ones, along with traveling salesmen and circus folk and carnival people, um, people that move around, you know, migrant labor groups. They they moved around a lot traditionally, but a large segment of people just stayed where they were born. It's just one of these things. It's where their support group is. If you have a family, usually that's the grandparents or their extended family is your support, meaning for family, uh, for babysitting and all all different types of things in case of emergencies. Nowadays, we have seen the farm that out. So people are more diversified in their geographic surroundings. So the accent isn't as dependent. You got these people growing up until they're 18, going to college someplace in another part of the country, then coming home. I mean, with cable, a lot of people that grew up in different parts of the country have similar accents because they're exposed to that. Now, if you're talking to people, there's still young people that have strong accents. But usually the strongest accents are left to people that are over 50. And so regional accents are, are I'm not saying they're disappearing. You don't, you just don't see it as much in the younger folk. Especially when they're talking to people online and things like that. When half the people they're talking to are not from their region. So why would you adapt or adopt that kind of accent. When you learn your language on the streets, it sounds like very middle middle class to lower middle class thing to say, learning out on the streets or lower class. And much like the bird seeds bring different birds, the accents on these shows kind of drag out. You know, when you heard that Philadelphia accent was expertly used in a show, you know, that that may be one of the last hurrahs of people with a strong accent. Like Boston. You don't hear that strong, you hear the strong Boston accent in older people. Same thing with New York, Manhattan, Bronx, Jersey, Georgia. You go to the big cities like Atlanta, People that were born in Atlanta and things like that, you don't hear. You're a, a type of Southern accent. You don't hear it in Miami. You don't hear it in Orlando. Not so much in Jacksonville. So, Charlotte. 
you know, these rural areas, you might. And sometimes it's for affectation. Imagine you grow up someplace and you have to put on an accent for affectation. Meaning to show that's where you're from. I I know people that come from uh, New Jersey, Philadelphia region and stuff. And they always go, how you doing? How you doing? How you doing? Doing. You know? What's up? How you doing? All this stuff. How you doing? Or the word water or chocolate. You know, I had a problem with saying orbital. And I have no problem saying orbital right now. Orbital, yeah, for satellite. They did. And it was another word yesterday I was trying to figure out. I was talking to my daughter on the way to school. I couldn't say it correctly because I was thinking about it. That was my thing. I'm, I still, to this day, I mean, everyone has it. They say, what are you trying to say? Like Clouseau, Inspector Clouseau. I would like a room, a room. It was room. You're like a pool. Pool, pool, when he's trying to say pool. An Englishman affecting a French, out, an outrageous French accent. Yep. So, nowadays, what is that? What is an American accent? You hear it online when you watch these shows on HBO, these international shows. So, The Nevers. I was watching. And I had a point. I was talking about the Nevers. It was coming on after. They, they have. It takes place in London. I think Edwardian London. Yeah, you know, right after Victoria, like the eighteen late eighteen nineties, early nineteen hundreds, pre World War One. And there's characters with English accents. There's a couple of them that don't. Like there's a. A, a, a doctor who doesn't have it, and there's some time traveling. So one of the, you know, one of the characters has to, who's an, inhabiting an English body, who may have been an American born in Canada or something like that. They were adopting an English accent on purpose, much like who, who's that woman, the uh, Gwyneth Paltrow. With their affectation. Different accents. And when it comes to technology, talk about affectations. I was talking on the last episode about cell phones. I, I purchased a new cell phone because my carrier is not servicing previous G technologies. Now it's only doing 4G and 5G. I think they're not servicing 2G. And I wasn't sure what my phone was. So I had to go and look it up. But they knew. They knew I had a a phone that wasn't going to handle the network. So they said, oh, you're going to have to upgrade. Okay. Well, they thought I was going to do it with them. I'm not going to do it with them because I buy it outside. I buy an open phone and I swap the SIM card. And I'm good to go. For some people, people think they have to go to this, you know, it's one of these things, you got to get a new one. And you have to have the newest. You always have to have the newest. I, I don't feel that way. Unless that feature is the feature you need that they just came up with. I remember Samsung when they came out with their first water-resistant phone or water-proof. It depends on that. They made a big deal about people, you know, Spilling shit on it in the commercials. And not making a big deal. Nowadays, it's like a lot of phones, there's no big deal about having water spilled on the phone. Some of them actually can go into water. I mean, that'll be the next thing. You can remain underwater for like a day. Because usually when you drop these people down here, we're in the Keys. People take their phones and they're drinking on a sightseeing boat. And they lean over to take a picture of a what they think is a dolphin. It could be a kayak. They don't know. Oh, look, a shark. That's not a shark. That's a plastic bag. Well, they're leaning over to the side to do it and they're drinking and stuff like that. And then all of a sudden, what happens? What happens with the things you don't want to happen? It happens. The phone goes into water. 
And salt water, that's it. You could do whatever you want, unless, you know, now with old technology, with the waterproof thing, maybe. Depends on how deep it goes, right? You still see it. I remember a couple of years ago, there was a couple that was on one of the Bayside resorts and they were taking pictures and one person put their phone on top of a post on a dock. So think of a top of a, of a, one of the posts and they put their phone up and it's silver iPhone <coughs> and a bird, I think a pelican comes, grabs it thinking it was a fish. And it grabbed it and flew off. And by the time it realized it wasn't a fish after a couple of feet and it just dropped it. Or it slid out because it's not wiggly. They figure, oh, this fish is stiff and flat. It's already been apportioned. This is one of those fish sticks that I heard about. No, it was a phone. So they dropped it and the people see the phone go in and they can see it glowing. And it was, I guess, around sunset. It was dark. And they can see it glowing in the water. And that's from salt water incursion into your phone. Once you see it glowing, that means it's it's in your battery and stuff. Like chances are, you know, you could do the the rice thing. You know, it's funny. People, some people didn't know when they're first coming out with the rice thing that they would get rice from a steam rice from an Asian restaurant. And didn't realize that, you know, it has to be dry rice because dry rice is uh, absorbent. That's the only thing. It's absorbent. If you, anything you put it in, you could put it in uh, absorbent sawdust or things. Actually, that's not really good for it to cake on. So rice is big enough that it absorbs it and small enough that it kind of gets in the crevices and things like that and acts as a absorption sink. So, those new features on the phone, I, it kept keeps me ordering a phone. Oh, you can't, your phone won't be any good anymore, so you have to get a new one. A great sales technique. I'm not saying that the rollout of G5 is a sales te- technique. They're rolling out new features to make it faster, to accommodate more bandwidth, to get more phones, right? Because if you run out of bandwidth, you can't offer, offer services. And if you can't offer services, you can't charge more. Right? Well, let me introduce you to some of the service we get in the Keys. It's kind of shitty down here. Because they talk about high-speed internet and all that stuff. There's no high-speed and there's no continuous internet. As re- evidenced by my previous episodes. It went out. Internet has gone out on a regular basis down here. In, in our uh, the bars we did the shows from. Always did a live show from the bar. I used to, that's where I went to recorded shows. You can't guarantee those. I mean, ra- that's one thing radio has. When you got to continue, when you have the broadcast, control of the broadcast medium. I don't have control of the broadcast medium. I have access to the broadcast medium, and the broadcast medium is the internet. But the internet is not always on down here. And I know that's true in most places. You know, in a lot of third world countries, they don't have electricity more than like a couple hours a day. Same thing going for water. They have limited limited services, limited supply. So they don't provide it all, all the time. It's kind of like the keys when it comes to that. It's like being in a drought. It's like the gas ser- service that recently happened, the hacking of the colonial pipeline. And people, for some reason, you know, you had people that wanted to tie the description of the Colonial Pipeline to the the current administration. You know, they were talking about, oh, it's going to be $4 gas. Well, there's no $4 gas yet. There is in places that were people were doing price gouging that were affected by the Colonial Pipeline. But the Florida Keys and Miami were affected, even though we do not get our fuel from the Colonial Pipeline. We get it from... The um, golf side, we get tanker uh, tankers that come in and supply South Florida. So we're not su- supplied by the clone. We shouldn't have been affected. So what we were affected by was the hoarding of gasoline. The people see it happen and they start hoarding. And, you know, I see people with a fucking boat 
and they're not fishermen. And they're just hoarding fucking gasoline. And boats burn gasoline. If you're not part of the boat, boat culture, uh, it's easy to say maybe a minimum of, a, you know, multitudes of gas. Can, well, it starts out with a diesel, diesel engine. And a lot of sailboats and trawlers have those diesel engines, and they're most efficient. But they're still not even as efficient mile per mile as the most efficient car. The multitudes more uh, fuel they use for the distance they travel. And then you get four or five engine boats, and then it's just, it's gallons per mile. Gallons per mile. Not miles per gallon, gallons per mile. Yep, that's the way it is. Uh, Recently... That um, so so when that gas pipeline supply issue happened, we had some places we had people lining up, especially when they showed on television saying there's you know fuel shortages coming this summer. I mean there 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 will be, I mean due to supply and the way the vagaries of the logistics systems that supply it and stuff like that, people can hack in with and put a ransomware in someone's system and charge. You know, say we're going to stop the supply of it unless you pay this amount of money. But in the long run, in the long run, we all see that thing we were talking about a couple of years ago. You can deny it. You can deny as much as you want, but electric vehicles are coming. Um, there's still people out there touting hydrogen vehicles because of fires. They go and say, oh, hydrogen vehicles are much safer. If there was many hydrogen-powered vehicles as there were electric vehicles, We'd be seeing certain issues with hydrogen power vehicles, but they're not. So you're not going to see the magnitude of difficulties stretch across millions of vehicles, millions of vehicles. And that's electric. Every car company is coming out with electric vehicle. There's companies that are exclusively electric. The infrastructure is switching to electric. And you will see by the number of gas stations that are built, being built, versus charging stations being built, that that will just accelerate over time. Much like this cell phone to 5G. Now, it's not like with cell phones, they're just doing like incremental changes, right? The big drastic change occurred back in the early, late 1990s, early 2000s, when cell phones became... Not as much as a novelty, but as growing into a necessity, a perceived necessity. No necessity. Necessity. You fucking need you need a cell phone. You know, you get sales. First, it was salespeople, um, emergency vehicles. I mean, uh, first responders, people in the medical. I should have put medical people first, but you know. But people that have to be online, trading people, people say, oh, I can now I can now I can be in touch with the office all the time, which is great for the person <coughs> that runs a company. Not so great for the people that work at the company. If I not. And it, it goes all the way down now to like people that work regular menial jobs and you, you either have off or you're on and you're never really off because you're doctor, your doctor, your it used to be an issue to say, should your. Employer call you at home. Your employer never called you at home unless there was an issue when you had regular phones. You never got a call from your employer. In most cases. But nowadays, with the ubiquitous, I can't say ubiquitous, there you go, I'm going to say it once, of cell phones in our lives, that we forget that that's, Everything. You're going to get questions. You're going to get text. You're going to get cell phone reminders. You're going to get calendars. You're link, You're integrated with your work. Some places, you know, all their schedules are done in calendars. They listen, uh, just link your Google calendar. Your, your Google calendar. I am not drinking. I don't know why. I am slurring right now. Maybe. I'm not having a stroke. It would be a system. I'm not having a stroke. But <clears throat> the... Integration of people with their place of work has continued, and people don't see it. Like you used to be out of work, you out of work. 
You're on vacation, you're on vacation. You don't hear, hey, do you remember what happened with that shipment that came in last week? You know, it used to be when you went away, that was it. When I started uh, working in manufacturing in the 1990s, there was a philosophy called just in time. And it was a principle of saying for in manufacturing that you had to, you did not warehouse or keep in stock a large amount of material that you needed to manufacture your goods, that you would get it delivered to your assembly point when you needed it. So this way, a lot of your money did not sit in stock, in your stock of raw materials. And it was a great concept. It kept the bottom lines. It kept physically, it says, you know, in one year we had the amount of stuff that we're going to manufacture, uh, you know, the material we needed to manufacture a certain amount of stuff. Well, we realize now with the vagaries of online ordering that you don't know what you're going to need when you're going to need it. Hence, toilet paper, always been gasoline, just a hint. But remember with COVID, you know, you have to have a certain amount of pulp. They need wood pulp to make paper and to make toilet paper. And then all of a sudden COVID hits. And for some reason, people think they're going to be shitting more at home. And I had a discussion with people before. If you need it, that is a special thing for me. Some people are accustomed to using, a lot of people are accustomed to using a toilet as a toilet when they're out. And I use, it's almost exclusively a urinal. It may be on a, a handful of times a year, unless I have issues or things like that, or when I'm traveling. Then I'm using anything other than as a urinal. I'm, I'm using my, I only, I don't want to get in too in depth because some, I hope you don't eat while I'm doing it. But when I got to take a shit, I like doing it at home. I was like George Costanza. I really didn't like doing it at some other people's houses. And it's not that I have bad habits or any difficulties or anything. It's just a habit I've been into. And it's weird for a person that traveled as much as I did. You know? It would make for an uncomfortable travel. And it's only in the last 20 years that I really got comfortable doing that out of the house. Because I guess... I had a phobia. Maybe I had some uh, germ phobia. I mean, the bathroom's got to be hell for germ phobics. I always thought maybe I was. But then I realized if you have to go, you got to go. You're going to go wherever you have to go. Right? There's horrible gas station bathrooms. Bus station gas. You know, whatever. And why would anybody, on a side note, why would anybody use some of those bathrooms as... A sexual meeting place. I have no idea. It's the last thing in the world, unless you're into scatology, you know something about you know you just enjoy shit. And I'm talking about a lot. You may think I do, but I don't. I get a gag reflex from that. I just don't want to even want to think about it. So my point was, what I was doing at home. I was doing out. Why? Why would you need toilet paper? Couldn't I was, I was pretty much going to do the same amount I was going to do at home. Now girls are a little different because they got to pee. They got to use. So we may have met, went up maybe two rolls a month, maybe two, two, three ro- rolls a month, maybe. I think. Considering, and then when we bought toilet paper, I mean, it's like when I was single, when I got a six roll pack. I think I was good for a year. You know, that's the girl's girlfriend would spend a lot of time over there. And I realized, what the, what the hell? Why am I going through so much toilet paper? You know, I have tissues over here. You know, so whatever. Someone's blowing their nose. Who knows? But it's supply and demand. So when the phone system changes over to 5G and you only have that, they're going to have to sell that. What are you going to do with the old fucking phones? I'm trying to figure out who I'm going to, who's going to get it. I got this guy Howard, one of my, one of the friends of the show, who refuses. He, he's I think you may have heard his voice once or twice. And uh, I'm going to get 
I'm going to give him my old phone because the system he uses accepts it's 2 and 3G, whatever, 2, 3, and 4G setup, I guess. But it's probably only for a temporary amount of time. He's going to have to change the phone anyway. But I realize the Gordian's knot I'm getting into, or the difficulty I'm putting myself. The guy right now uses a flip phone. It looks like a flip phone from like 2000. And six, when it was like 2007, right when they're getting good at making flip phones and then the smartphone comes out, then the best looking sm- flip phone. Now, they're tr- still trying to uh, come across with the biggest, you know, the, be- the best thing of a flip phone is making it smaller, you know, pocket. You know, so you got Samsung and these other f- phones, they want to fold in half so they can make get to regular size. I mean, it's, it's fucking crazy. Because it used to be, at one point, it's getting smaller. And then they realize, well, you can't read anything on the screen when it's small. And then you think of Google Glasses. Well, just put a display on the glasses. And you see how long that lasts. People don't like Google Glasses. Because, you you know, they came out with words like glass holes. A, a Google Glasses were a small little screen they put inside your glasses. And you could see it. And it was right up there. A heads-up display on your your glasses. And you could direct it with your eye eyes and things like that to read text messages and things like that so you could be looking at someone also looking at your email and you people could tell you're wearing kind of a different kind of glasses and responding differently to you know making weird faces if they get an incredulous email or provocative email who knows so technology changes on a whim and then you get a feel because of everyone having a cell phone now you feel you have to change because it you're not, your phone's not going to be supported by their network, so you got to get the next best one. Do you need all the features in the best phone, the next phone? People say, oh, well, you got to get this because it has proprietary software, Apple. And it's safer to have end to end control, meaning from development to implementation. Well, this is great, but it also restricts, restricts the amount of things you can use. And you got to wait for the next app to come out. They decide it's important and it's important. So you're weighing the ideas of what I'm going to spend for it, how much I'm going to spend on insurance and all that stuff to get the phones. And I'd like to make the analogy of people with their, you know, they had phones when I was a kid. There were still phones around, dial phones, where you had a, a rotary phone. But old ones. I've seen old ones. But once the rotary phone came, you know, they, people say, well, I need a push button. Well, you could do it much faster than push button. You just hit the button, the numbers, do, 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 and hit that. Hit it and it makes a phone call. But, it, you know, with a rotary phone, you got to hit each number, bring it down to the, the stop, and let it go. So you got one, nine, which is the longest, all the way over. And you got to wait, go back, then three. I mean, not rarely one, you know, unless you're going to an international call or something like that. You had to use 10 numbers, not 11 numbers with one. You had to put one in the in the area code. But they people had rotary phones to the very end. Uh, there could still be rotary phones. I think they still would work. Right? But the, with the push-button phones. I mean, cordless phone was, is still the last. They still people have it, even though cordless phones go out when you you know sometimes with you know the power on the phone is supposed to work. But if it's a corded phone and the base is powered, and you lose it, that's the thing because the power, the electricity, the phone has a certain amount. The phone lines have its own dedicated electrical supply. But I don't know if it's enough. And, you know, if someone, anybody knows, you can send me a you know, response to that. I'll do a, a little. But who cares? You know, that's old technology. Seeing whether you do it. It's like seeing it's, oh, when does a, a telegraph work? And shit like that. So here I am getting a new cell phone. When the, the old cell phone was all right. You know, it's starting to see things that was, you know, was doing bad. Maybe it had too many apps on it. You get too many apps because you got, oh, I can do this. I can do, you know, my bookkeeping here and tracking of this here. And there's a game here. 
Oh, and then I got my online uh, fo- uh, photograph repository for my uh, my electric uh, screens for my my photograph, my albums. When you put them, you know, some people have. You can put it on your TV and your. I actually I got to put it on my TV the app so I can just post. We can do pictures, our family pictures on the TV. That'd be like the perfect thing to do during a show. And you can do it during a party, someone's birthday party. Yes. Oh, my God. Jim, you don't know that? No, now I know it. I know it. I just forget about it. There's so many things you could do. So <clears throat> I'm not one for throwing out the baby with the bathwater. A lot of times I like if I have a phone case and it works for another phone case, I like to do it. I hate the idea that, the old idea is when you had all these chargers and things like that, you have to do it. I still have all this electronics over here I'm looking at right now of old cell phones. I really can't give away because the batteries have degraded so much. I was going to de- I was going to donate it to an abuse shelter, you know, because these women have to be given new cell phones so they're not harassed and stuff like that. And they give them, a, you know, they give them a, a low, you know, a low-cost cell phone with a new number so they're not harassed by the person they're, you know, in a, a shelter for or whatever. And it's a good thing. You just, I hate throwing things out. Actually, electronics end up in landfills and they're so harmful byproducts inside the manufacturing of it. So right now I have my new cell phone. I'm, I'm, it's coming in today and i got to do that. And I start my spin class I'm back doing spin tomorrow, Thursday, and I had to go and check to see if the technology worked for that still. So I'm going to keep my cell phone going for a week. I mean, I'm supposed to get in the phone today, so I may try to bring the other phone up to see if I can get that to work and uh, use my current phone as a music one just in case. Because it's my first day back. I don't want to, you know, fuck up just because I can't access, access my music app. Oh, the troubles of living down here in the Keys and having multiple jobs. It's not that big a trouble. But do you think sometimes people put the same amount of thought in buying a, a cell phone, and a wireless phone, as they do into finding their mates? You, you don't see it... A, Often, it's, I think the wedding thing may have so, so many people have gotten divorces this during this pandemic, and I've seen people on Facebook and these resale apps. They have marketplaces selling things like their vacations and their things they would get at a wedding shower that they didn't use, like albums and shit like that. Who uses the album anymore when you have to? When you can just put it online and share with everyone. Well, I got this big book. I got it all every place in case. Or I can put it all on the cloud and then create an album. And people say, well, Jim, if singularity comes around, singularity when artificial intelligence takes over, you're going to be happy that you have that bound album with all the pictures in it because you won't have access to it because the artificial intelligence Overlord will not allow you to look at your wedding pictures. Good for you. Holy shit. I don't know. I do feel an eager. When someone asks a question about my family, I like to show pictures about them. But a guy's first instinct is not to go, hey, you want to look at pictures of the wedding? You know, that's not... I mean, for most guys, that's not his day. That was... The Bride's Day. And that's what they get to relive. Oh, there's the album. There's the one time in my life that I was treated like a queen. <laughs> I'm sorry. I was in the wedding business so much, I knew what that meant. It was such a high point. It's a shame that high point was so early in their lives. For many of them. In their mid to late 20s. See these. I, I was in the wedding business for quite a long time. And I knew, you know, after 10 after 10 years, a lot of times, you'd see a lot of people saying, how's everything going with your marriage? Meaning, are you still married? And there was no ulterior motive. It's not like I was asking some of the women 
if they were available, even though I did at least one or two ex-brides I've had uh, dates with. We're calling dates. That'd be a friendly way to call it, right? I think that's the most successful. So people were so cavalier about doing it. You know, it's time to get married. You got to get married. You hear people say it in all these movies. say, well, they, they were very good. They were very loyal. And they ignore the passion. I mean, passion is no basis for, um, it's not a primary basis for getting married all the time because all passion dies. And if you don't have the, uh, a passion can overpower friendship, uh, annoyances at certain particular human foibles or characteristics someone has. If you're passionate about someone, you can overlook so many things. Over so many things. I see people get in relationships and I'm looking at them and go, this is the person you're in a relationship with? Some of them I go, oh, I can see why they're in. They get, you guys get along really well. You're very friendly. But I don't know what they're like at home. I have no idea. I don't have anything about their personal habits and things like that. That people, When that passion dies down, that people start focusing on the other thing. When you, when you have a beautiful bouquet of roses and they smell terrific and they look terrific and all that stuff. And you're just admiring just the look and the smell of it, the whole aesthetics of a beautiful bouquet of roses. But when it starts crinkling up, when that smell starts not smelling so strong and the petals are starting to fall off, what are you thinking? Oh, well, I'm going to have to replace these pretty soon. Right? And that's a relationship a lot of times. If you don't have a lot of things going, I mean, if... If flowers don't have those things, think of that everything you keep, you keep it around because it's useful and helpful and beneficial to you in the long run. Obviously, if you're in a relationship, it's not beneficial to you and all it does is cause you aggravation and pain and suffering. Obviously, it's best to move on. But people jump into ones with things that without that one main thing, which is passion that people always confuse for long-term romantic love, passion. And people say, well, I, I still am passionate about some of my old girlfriends and boyfriends. That I still feel it. Well, you, it didn't run its course. You didn't run, it didn't, that relationship did not run its course. She did not get married to that person. If you got married, there's people that get married to people, get divorced, and they end up marrying again because the passion died down they liked some of the other things and realized afterwards they liked the other stuff so much that they would really willing to give it a try again and they get back together. So there's some times where people underestimate the passion or overestimate the passion or actually underestimate the other things besides the passion and overestimate the passion, meaning that'll last long. And if your relationship's based on passion, just think of those you know old movies and old movies, when I say movies, over 25, 30 years. Right, 30 years ago, there was a movie called, uh, I think it was called Nine and a Half Weeks. And it was Mickey Rourke. And who's the woman that was in it? Mickey Rourke, Kathleen Turner. I don't know who's in Nine and a Half. No, 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 no. No, blonde. She was married to Alec Baldwin. Mickey Rourke and... God, I forget her name. Kim Basinger. Kim Kim Basinger. See? I get it back eventually. And then passion. That's passion. That was passion. There was a lot of sexy fruiting, intense sex role-playing and things like that. They didn't, that the reason why they didn't call it nine and a half years, because if they had gotten married, you'd see the aftermath of that. And there's, there's movies that always showed uh, the passion of their earliness or, you know, about the forbidden love. And then when they get together, and after, you know, they realize that it's day to day, 
you got to be like in it for the long haul. And some of those things do not last. I mean, if you could be passionate for 50 years, whew, fucking intense. That's great. But you got to have some respect and love and love the things that change in a person, too. And the reason why you care about them is their, the innateness of who they are. Innate quality. Without the first look thing. Right? Because every flower eventually loses its bloom. But you can remember it's still a flower. So that's where it comes to relationships. And I try to equate those. Cell phones when it's usual. Like there's my buddy using a cell phone for years that... You think no one uses it anymore, but it works for him? Why not? Same thing for relationships, right? And I don't, and I have to, if the phone does not work as a phone anymore, which ATT is suggesting, I got to get a new one. So that's the unlike one. It's like in the extreme circumstances of relationships. Let's say your partner does something outside of your relationship. And they decide to murder someone. And do it in the first degree. With intent. Intent to kill. Planning. And they go for the rest of their lives. And you just say, well, you know, you made the decision without me. Uh, I'm going to have to change it because this isn't going to work for me. This I did not. And some people may say, hey, this is work. I know, know where you are from now on. This will work for us. You could be in there. I'll check in with you every so often. You know? So we're gonna, you know, we're gonna have an open relationship now. You can be open in prison, and I'll be open out here. <laughs> yeah, well, you see how it is. Well, this is Jim the Keys bartender, second show. I'd like to thank you for listening. I am going to sign off. If you do like the show, follow us on Facebook, on Instagram. Send me a message at Jim at keysbartender dot com if you have any questions. And remember, try to retest that cell phone. Try to reuse it. Uh, you know, any electronics. Donate. Make sure you wipe them. Get an expert to wipe them. Someone you trust. Get your financial data out of there. Your personal stuff that you can get your identification spoofed or stolen. Uh, but thank you very much, Jim. The Keys bartender signing off. I'll talk to you later. Bye. <laughs>